I made a mistake in my recent video about how to build an option type in TypeScript. I said that there wasn't really a great way to have a function that can take either a function or a promise and return either the return value of that function or a promise. Someone pointed out in the comments that this is a great place to use function overloading. And so we're gonna take a look at function overloading in this video today. Function overloading is pretty simple. The idea is that you give a function multiple signatures, each of which describes a different set of arguments that this function is capable of receiving. Here's a simple example from the TypeScript docs. The idea is that we have this length function that we want either to take a string or to take an array of something. And in both cases, we're gonna return the length of either that string or that array. Now, this is an incredibly simple example. And to be honest, if we just said string or array of any, we don't really need these overload signatures. This at least shows you an example of the syntax for how overloading functions is supposed to work. You write your function as you normally would, and it's important that the arguments that this function takes be as broad as possible. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then you can add more specific function signatures above that. And notice that the syntax is pretty much exactly the same as the function below, just instead of having the function body, we just end with a semicolon. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind when you're writing functions like this is that the final function signature or the one that is actually attached to the function body needs to be broad enough to accept all of these sets of arguments that we pass above. So for example, if we replace the type of X in our last function signature here with something else, maybe let's say we expect this to be a number array. Well, notice that we now have an error above that. This overload signature is not compatible with its implementation signature. So the idea is that this implementation signature needs to be broad enough to accept all of the above. Of course, this makes sense because when you implement your function body, you need the arguments that you're working with to match all of the possible function signatures that might be accepted. So let's look at a couple of more real life examples for how this might work. Let's start with something that's pretty close to the function that we would have written in that option type video a couple of weeks ago. Here is a maybe function that might return a value or might just swallow an error. So we have a generic T and we take a function or a promise, the function returns a T or the promise resolves to a T. And then we have a couple of different return values here. It could be T, right? If we get a function here, we might return T. Now, if the function throws an error, we're gonna return undefined, so we need to include that. Or we could receive a promise, in which case we have to return a promise. The promise could resolve to T, so this is a promise of T, or the promise could reject, in which case we need to return a promise of undefined. And so this is a pretty complex function signature, but it's fairly straightforward for us to work with. We can check to see if the type of function or promise is a function, and if it is, we can call the function and catch the error returning undefined if there is an error. Then of course, if this is not a function, we know it's a promise, and so we can resolve that promise and we'll just add a catch on here that returns undefined in the case of an error, so that now maybe we'll always resolve, it just might resolve with undefined. Now the function signature here is not the simplest function signature, but it's not really that hard to follow. So where does overloading come in? Well, let's take a look at what happens when we use this maybe function. Let's look at the promise one first actually, because this is a little more straightforward. If we look at the value of y, we can see that y is either string or undefined. I think it understands that await applies to the promise return type, and so it knows that this could be t or undefined. Of course, if maybe does not return a promise, then t or undefined is what we get anyway, so the type kind of collapses to just t, in this case string, or undefined. However, we don't get that when we just pass it a function, or maybe more specifically, when we don't use the await keyword. If we hover over x here, we can see that we have the full possible return type, string, undefined, or promise of string or undefined. And that's not really useful as a consumer of this function. It would be much better to know that this is going to return a string or undefined and not have to worry about the possibility of a promise here. So this is a great place to use function overloading. Function overloading does not make your job as a function writer easier. It gives you more code to maintain. However, as a function consumer, it definitely gives you clarity. So let's write two overload signatures for this function. I'm going to copy the existing signature and paste it above twice. And then let's go ahead and edit this. So there's two different arguments we want to accept. First is just the function that returns a T. And in that case, we just need to return T or undefined. Then the other possible return type, of course, 
is the promise of t. And then let's get rid of t or undefined here. And we're just going to return a promise of undefined. Both of these are sub signatures, I guess you could say, of the implementation signature. And now if we hover over x down here, we can see that it is clearly string or undefined. We know exactly what this is going to be because TypeScript can now use the overload signatures to determine what the possible return type could be given the possible arguments. So I think this is a nice example of how you can use signature overloading to tightly couple particular sets of arguments to a particular return type. Now, it's not always just about coupling arguments to return types. It could be about coupling different sets of arguments together. Let's look at a slightly more complex example here. I'm going to paste in some code here that may seem like a lot, but let's go through this. It's pretty simple. We've got a simple type here, a widget name environment created at. Then we've got a couple of utility functions here that help us determine what the type of a particular argument is. Is it a string? Is it a date? Is it a widget? And we need these because we have a pretty complex function going on down here. We want to be able to update a widget and there are two particular signatures that we want to support. You can pass an update as the first argument, which is a partial widget, and a widget as the second argument and then no third argument. Or we want to accept a key as the first argument, a value as the second argument, and a widget as the third argument. And in both cases, we want to update the widget that we receive with either the update or the new key and value. And this seems kind of complex, but it's not that uncommon. I think you'll find a lot of functions in, say, Lodash that have a signature that might be something along these lines. Now, the code for this function is not great. It almost has a flavor of the type of JavaScript I would have written pre-TypeScript, where I have to do a lot of checking for the types of particular arguments and then throwing errors if the arguments are wrong. Unfortunately, this is the way we have to write TypeScript when we want to be this broad in the types of values we want to accept. And where we really are trying to have basically two different function signatures here. And so this is how we have to write it. We have to check to see is that first argument a string? And then is the second argument not a widget? And then is the third argument a widget? And in the cases where those things are not all true, we have to throw errors. And then finally, we get to our simple use case at the end of just extending the existing widget with the update. Now, this, as you can imagine, is going to be a nightmare to use as a function. There's like six or eight ways that we could call this function and TypeScript would consider them all to be valid according to these types. But there's only two that are really acceptable. There's only two that won't return with an error. If we try and do update widget, we can pass name as a first argument and we can pass some kind of widget as the second argument. We know that this call is going to throw an error, but TypeScript accepts this as a valid way to call this function. So let's fix that. We'll add two new function signatures that TypeScript can use to determine how this is supposed to work. Let's have this first one be the one that takes the partial update object. So we'll just have the partial widget as our first argument, and we'll have the full widget as our second argument, and we have no third argument in this case. And in this case, we don't need that generic, so we can drop that. In the second example here, we only will accept the key as the first argument, the value as the second, and this third argument is not optional. We need that widget there. The way this works is that TypeScript will use these two function signatures as the valid signatures that we can use when writing this function. It won't allow us to use arguments that don't match one of those two even if they may match the third implementation signature. We can see this in practice if we come back down to our example here. We're getting an error. We're saying that name here has no properties in common with the type partial widget. So it recognizes that when we only have two arguments, the second one's a widget, this first one really needs to be a partial widget. So there's a couple of ways we could fix this. We could say that name equals something else here. And if we do that, now this is an acceptable way to call the function. The other thing we could do instead, we could add another argument in here and put our new name as the second argument. And that is also acceptable. The other pretty cool thing I think is that if we change this say to env, we even have good type checking on the actual values. And this is of course because we said k must extend the key of widget and then the value must be widget at k. It's really easy for us to not only get good type checking on the set of arguments, but also on the actual values of these arguments where new name is not assignable to the parameter of dev or prod. And so if we're going to use env here, we have to set prod or dev as our second argument here. And finally, notice if we go to call update widget in the tooltip that we get here, notice there are two possible function signatures, one that takes the partial widget or the widget and the other that takes the key, the value and the widget. Again, keep in mind that this doesn't really make your job simpler as the function 
writer. We still have to handle every possible way that these arguments could be given to us. And as a result, you get kind of this mess like this. And so maybe you want to make the call that instead of writing and maintaining this type of code, I'm just going to make this two separate functions with two separate signatures and the user can call the one they want. This may be mostly useful to you if you're trying to convert some old JavaScript that has multiple function signatures to TypeScript. And with this, you can do it in a type safe way. To be honest, I don't reach for function overloads too often in my own code. I generally prefer to either accept a narrower set of arguments or just write them as two separate functions. But it's a useful tool to have in my back pocket for those times when I really need it. If you have great examples of places where you have used function overloading in TypeScript, I would love to hear about those in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.